أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف المرسلين سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. How are you doing? الحمد لله الحمد لله. I think last night uh, uh, we need to do a quick recap. There were a lot of names last night. I think people got kind of confused. Just quickly, we said the Umayyad family, the Umayyad dynasty, took control of the Muslim Ummah, and this is the first kingship after the four rightly guided Khalifas. We then had a ruling family for about 100 years. They called the Umayyads. And at the height of their power, when they ruled, um, and at that point in time, no person on earth in history had such control as Al-Walid had. From Spain, as we said, until China. Nobody had absolute control like this. And it was in that moment when the Umayyads were at the height of their decadence, the height of their uh, arrogance and oppression, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would have sent the first mujaddid, the first reformer of the Ummah called Umar II, or Umar ibn, ibn Abdul Aziz. We mentioned that he was a cousin of the, the ruler. He had no line of succession. In fact, every Khalifa was planned. The next three Khalifas were all planned. He was not part of the plan. And then when Sulaiman, one of the Khalifas passed away very early, very unexpectedly. He was on his deathbed. He looked at his life. He felt remorse. He felt regret. And you know, that's how it is. You had all the enjoyment and the minute Malik al comes, you realize, what did I do? He called a sheikh and he says, Sheikh, Mawlana, make dua for me. What can I do now? And the sheikh said, well, nothing to do now. The only thing that we hope is try to appoint a good successor. And so he chose his cousin, Umar ibn Abdul Aziz, the great grandson of Sayyidina Umar, as the next Khalifa completely without uh, anyone away. And as we mentioned yesterday, after they buried Sulaiman, the Khalifa, the Umayyad family got together in Damascus at their headquarters. The chief of the police was there. And the official uh, uh, um, imam, he took, this is the last will and testament of Khalifa Sulaiman. Do you all agree? The chief of police is there with his sword. Everyone says, yes, we agree. And he opened the note and he said, the successor is Umar ibn Abdul Aziz ibn, Abdul, ibn, uh, uh, ibn Mar Marwan. And Everyone is shocked, in, most of all, Umar himself. And the first words that he says is, Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi rajiun. This can't be. There must be a mistake. And he refuses initially. He said, I cannot accept this. I refuse to accept this. But with the fear of a civil war, he is forced to go to the masjid, in the Grand Mosque of Damascus. This is called, as we said, this is called the Grand Mosque of the Umayyad Mosque. It's still there today. And as we said, there's a hadith where the Nabi says that Qiyama. When Qiyama is about to come, Nabi Isa will descend in Damascus at the white minaret of the Grand Mosque. And that was before there was any masjid in Damascus. Nabi Isa gave this hadith before any Muslim came to Damascus. But the Grand Mosque now is the mosque of the Umayyads. So he comes to the mosque and he now gets on the mimbar and he gives his first sermon. And look what he says. He says, O oh people, I have been burdened with the responsibility of the caliphate against my own will. I don't want this. And without your consent, I'm not, I don't agree to it. And you want, were you asked? You weren't asked. So I remove the oath of allegiance from everybody that is around your neck. I say, you are uh, resolved. No, you don't have to follow me. And let us elect a new Khalifa. That's his first inaugural address. Have you ever heard a president say that? <laughs> the results are, <laughs> I won, but I shouldn't win. And the crowd cried out. He expected them to say someone else. And they cried out, you, we want you. We have chosen you, O Amir al-Mu'mineen. And we are pleased that you have been blessed and honored our good affairs. And he waits and he waits and no one is, is leaving the masjid. So then he says, Amma ba'd, but to proceed. Verily there is no prophet after, after the Nabi Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And there will be no divine book after the Quran. Indeed, Allah has resolved this matter until Qiyamah. Therefore, I'm not here as a judge, but rather to execute the command of Allah. And I'm not here to innovate or change or make anything new, but I am here to follow and be obedient to Allah and the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. In which case, nobody is to obey me should I act in disobedience to Allah. I am not better than any of you. I am just a man from amongst you that has been burdened with a heavy burden greater than you. Meaning I have now been put on a, on a difficult thing that none of you should look envy on me. You should be saying shame for me. 
Then he says, guys, and subhan, look at these words. He says, oh ummah, we are not divided over our Rabb. Are we divided? Does any Muslim divide over who's our Allah? Are we not, and we're not divided over our Nabi. And we're not divided over our Quran. But we're divided over rands and cents and dollars, dirhams and dinars. Money is what divides us. Our problem is money. Therefore, meaning this is what I'm going to fix. And oh people, as for he who obeys Allah, his obedience and his duty, but that, then you should obey him. So when I obey Allah, you obey me. And if I disobey Allah, then you must disobey me. And so obey me so long as I'm in the obedience of Allah. Now, now that he becomes a Khalifa, what is he going to do? The first thing, subhanAllah, he begins, he already mentions in his inauguration, I'm going to look at the corruption that's happening within the Umayyad family and within the, the, the Caliphate, and he starts with himself. The first thing he does is he collects every property, every bit of wealth that he has, and he goes to Saz, the revenue, and he says, all of this I got from the Umayyads. I don't know where this comes from. It's haram money for me. I'm rather going to be a public servant. Give me a salary, and I will rent a house, not the palace. Subhanallah. He moves his family and his wife. Now his family, and Allah bless her, what a woman she was. And remember, she was the daughter of the great Abdul Malik. Her four brothers were all Khalifas. Her husband is now the Khalifa. She has only known the palace. She has only known the good life. Now he's saying to her, my love, you either come with me out of the palace and we live in a rented apartment, or I divorce you and you can remain. And she comes with him. After she packs up and she is about to leave, he says, he looks at her packing her bags, her jewelry. He says, where did you get that jewelry? That was given to you from whom? We need to return your jewelry to the Baytul Mal, subhanAllah. And she does so. And she does so. What a great woman. And so they live in this rented apartment. No great bodyguards when the police, the chief of police said, but you need security. He said, the only reason a Khalifa needs security from the people is if they hate him. I mean, the previous, Sayyidina Ali, how was he killed in Salah? Anybody could attend, come to you and shake your hand. When the people love you, there's no reason for police. The only reason politicians have a whole entourage of police is because we hate them. And so we need to keep uh, them away from the people. And so he basically took away the, the, the police services. He took away all these special privileges. And then he punished the head of SARS, the tax collector. And he said, all the oppression you've done, you need to make tawbah for every city that you've stolen from. One year sentence to every city. They had to go and serve a sentence and apologize to the people. Besides for reform in money, we'll talk more about that. He's also one of the great you know, uh, 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 one of the reasons why our knowledge and our, our tradition is preserved in Islam. The hadith at this point, there's no Bukhari. There's no books of hadith. There's no books of seerah. He realized that the scholars in Medina only are going to live for so long, then they're going to die, and that knowledge is going to be left. We need to start putting this into books. And so he's the first Khalifa to commission that we need to collect at least the hadith of the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the, and the fiqh rulings. And so in Medina, he appoints uh, um, the, the most leading of scholars to compile Islam in book form. And in fact, he himself was a scholar in the sense that you find him narrating hadith. You don't find any Khalifa on this Khalifa. No, Khalifas don't come in the books of hadith. But Umar ibn Abdul Aziz was a scholar in his own right, and he related hadith that was put in the books. He also had extensive public works in Persia, North Africa, Afghanistan. Now, interesting, not in Syria. Now, Syria was the heartland of the Umayyads. So the areas that were neglected, this is where he focused on building and expanding. He had no great expansions in his time, meaning no, no jihads happened in his, in his short reign, but he had good relations internally with all the, the, uh, the Khawarij are still there, the Shias are still there revolting. They all had peace. In fact, in fact the only Khalifa the Khawarij didn't rebel against was Umar Abdul Aziz. And as for the, the Dhimmis, the Dhimmis are the non-Muslims living within the Islamic lands. There were more non-Muslims living within the Islamic empire than Muslims. And there was no effort from the Umayyads to convert them, to revert them. Why? Because you could tax them. There's a special tax on, called the jizya, a special tax on the, on the, on the non-Muslims. And so the Umayyads like this. We could tax them to death. And this is what's going to pay us. And so, say, uh, uh, Umar Abdul Aziz had a process of cutting away most of the jizya for those who couldn't afford it. He gave back their churches. He gave back their, their spaces of worship. And he encouraged them to enter into Islam. Ibn Kathir, the great tafsir Mufassir, he also has a big book of uh, history. Ibn Kathir has the tafsir, the very famous tafsir, but he also wrote a book of history. He says, in this, within one year, 
the tax revenue from Persia went up from 28,000, 28 million dirhams to 124 million dirhams. So by doing, by removing corruption, the people had no incentive to cheat. And subhanAllah, this is what they say. That when you see the government stealing and the government corrupt, you're going to make every opportunity to cheat them. Everyone's cheating the other one. But where you see a man is just. And he says, look, this is the haq of Allah. And I'm going to take it for the orphan and the widow and to build roads. Then everybody says that I also need to play my part. And by doing the right thing, the coffers were full. To the point where some cities wrote back and said, we have waited for a year, we haven't spent our zakah budget. We can't, it's still here. What should we do? Also, when many of his agents wrote that his physical reforms, especially with the reverts, is resulting in many people becoming Muslim now. And we can't tax them, this is going to be a disaster. He said, Alhamdulillah, fantastic. Soon I look forward that you and I, we will now have to go and work in the fields because there's no more tax money for us to pay our salaries. I look forward to that day, alhamdulillah, that we, that because they entered into Islam. One of the uh, uh, tax collectors said, Amir Mu'minin, you're too soft. What if the people, can I, can we, how can I punish people for not paying their taxes? And he writes back, and alhamdulillah, we have his letters. He says, how strange is it that you seek my permission to torture a human being as if I was some kind of protection against Allah, Allah's punishment. Or if my pleasure can rescue you from Allah's displeasure. Therefore, once you've received this letter, and once you've got taken note now, approach those who pay, uh, pay taxes with the utmost compassion. Administer an oath from them. Just say, say, wallahi, you have no taxes to pay. Imagine your tax return form. I swear by Allah that there's nothing to declare to SARS. You know, you come to the customs, wallahi, no, nothing to declare to SARS. Just take the oath from Allah. He says, by Allah, it is better for them to face Allah having committed treachery than for us to face Allah having tortured an innocent person. I don't want that on me. He even set limits in terms of standards, in terms of weights, and even animals had special can't weigh, can't put too much uh, on the camel. And really, subhanAllah, you can imagine him thinking about Sayyidina Umar, his great grandfather. Sayyidina Umar at some point went in a type of depression when he was the Khalifa. And they said, Ya Amir al-Mu'mineen, why? Why are you so depressed? He said, can you imagine that right now, somewhere in the Ummah, there is a camel whose feet is is paining because the road isn't fixed and he's going to complain to Allah about Umar. Umar didn't fix the road. I have to account for not only the people but the animals in this Ummah. SubhanAllah, it's true leadership. He reduced the salaries of the Umayyad family and he started confiscating their own property. This became a problem now. He started going at his own family members. Some stories and subhanAllah, this is like extreme level of taqwa. They would say that when they would, uh, a govern, government officials would come to visit him in his house and meetings would go into the evening. When they were done with the meeting and now they started talking lightly, uh, like you know, more casually, he would put the lamp off. And we're sitting in the dark. And he said, why are we sitting in the dark, Ya Amir al-Mu'mineen? He said, this lamp is for government purposes. This conversation we're having is not government work. It's like, and, and think of us, subhanAllah, we get that company cell phone. So we phone someone, our part, you know, some customer or whatever, and we talk business. Then we start talking about the weekend. Or imagine, say, let me put the phone down. I'm going to call you from my private number. This phone was not meant for us to have a chit-chat. This level of taqwa. When his wife was asked about what, you know, uh, because he dies quite young, subhanAllah. They asked, what made him such a person? And she said that in my, he wasn't anything spectacular compared to anyone else. He just had a deep sense of accountability to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He would always ask, Ya Allah, I hope that I have not transgressed the rights of anybody else. I don't want anybody to claim against me on the day of Qiyamah. I don't want any, any person to challenge me for I have taken from the, their rights. And so subhanAllah, and remember we're talking in the series about the problems in the ummah. Do we not have people that are spectacularly wealthy in this ummah? That, have, that are above the law. But they can enjoy themselves and party like they want to. That's up to them. Or they can change the ummah with their wealth and their power. This man, he only lived as Khalifa for two years, two and a half years. But you know, obviously once you start cutting the tenders and you're taking those people out, you now become a target. And unfortunately he was poisoned. And most likely from the Umayyad family, which we will see tomorrow the consequences of that. He was poisoned by a slave, and when he asked that slave, so why did you do this? And the slave said, well, for my freedom. The Umayyads offered me a huge amount. He said, don't tell me who paid you, I don't want to know. But as for, I will set you free, I pardon you, go, let him go free. And the, the, the thousand, they gave you money, that money we paid to the treasury, that's the, that's the penalty for my death, and you go free. And so on his deathbed, 
He assembles his family, he gives them a speech. When they said, Khalifa, you actually have no inheritance to give. You have zero property to give your family. He said, Alhamdulillah. And the Sheikh said, but aren't you worried about your kids? They're still young. So he said, and look at these words. He says, if my children are righteous, then I'm comfortable Allah will take care of them. And if they are not righteous, then I don't want to give them money to add in their destruction. Then that's even worse for them. So inshallah, I'm comfortable. And the Sheikh said, Wallahi, I saw that the sons of Sulaiman, the previous Khalifa, they inherited millions, billions. They all ended up beggars. Whereas every child of Umar bin Abdul Aziz, later on in their life, they became very wealthy and they were financing the jihad later on in life. And so Umar bin Abdul Aziz, may Allah have mercy on him, dies. One of the few people that stood the test of absolute power. He reformed the Umayyad family and he brought Izza back to what Islam really meant to be strong and powerful. We don't do this for empires and monuments. And when we talk about the great, yes, those things are nice. But really it is the substance of why we, what we have come to do here, to bring the, 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 the Sharia of Allah on land, to bring justice to the Ummah. And so... He also reminded us a lot of our problems and fighting, that this unity is not about the deen, it's about egos and money. And with that, with this example, he revived that spirit of honesty on, on the ground. People wanted to be better. People wanted to be, to aspire to be of a higher caliber. Every person now in the ummah did when they did their business, they were honest. When they treated each other, they did it with integrity. And so subhanAllah, this was a reflection of his caliphate. He only ruled, as we said, for two and a half years. He passes away. And then the Umayyad family goes back to its, 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 its ways. And we'll see the consequences of that tomorrow, inshaAllah, when we talk about the next stage in, this, uh, in the Muslim series, with, uh, we say, the, the fight for the orthodoxy of Islam. Islam's orthodoxy, inshaAllah. Um, a few uh, announcements tomorrow, inshaAllah, is the uh, orphan program. If anybody would like to assist, inshallah, uh, 400 rand per orphan. We still have a few orphans that need sponsorship. Last night we asked the question, who was Umar bin Abdul Aziz's father-in-law? Remember his uncle was Abdul Malik. Abdul Malik the great Umayyad Caliph, who, who was the father of all the Khalifas. Abdul Malik's daughter, Fatima, Umar married her. So he married his first cousin, alhamdulillah. Um, Adnan, mashallah. And for the sisters, Hafsa Ariftin. Hafsa is here? My Hafsa, mashallah. So Hafsa and Fuad. Uh, tomorrow, what did the Umayyad family pay a slave to assassinate Umar? 100 pounds, 100 rupees, 100 dinars, 100, 1,000 riyal, sorry, 1,000. Whatever it was, subhanAllah. What a great uh, loss to the Ummah. Wa sallallahu sayyidina Muhammad wa ala sahbihi wa sallam 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 w